Well, good morning, everybody at New Life Church. I'm sad we can't be together in physical space, but at least I can speak to you today through the wonders of digital technology. My special thanks to Pastor Matt and the team for this invitation. England at the end of the 17th century was not a very attractive place in which to live. There were very few chances for social or economic advancement. 50% of the population were at least moderately poor. 20% of the population were considered very poor. At the dawn of the 18th century, England was afflicted with a gin problem. Gin was cheap to buy and you didn't need a license to sell it. And for many people, it was their only source of comfort in a very dreary existence. Into this environment of poverty, alcohol abuse and high mortality rates rode a man who, along with a large group of colleagues, instigated one of the largest, most influential networks of Christians in history. John Wesley graduated from Oxford University. He was ordained as a priest in the Church of England. He went on to pioneer the fastest growing network of Christians in Europe at the time and one of the most influential in history. In a way, this network was like one of the major global church networks of today. Its leaders were innovators. They wrote their own music, created new styles of worship. They evangelized in town squares and fields. They planted small groups across the land and many of those groups later became very significant churches. Their approach was so strategic, so methodical, that people began to call them the Methodists. So many people came to Christ through the Methodists that church historians began to talk about the Methodist revival. But that's not the end of their story. Decades later, that revival inspired social reform. The Clapham sect or Clapham group was a small band of Christians who met regularly in London. Its members were drawn from the worlds of mathematics, politics, academia, civil service, economics, publishing, banking. There was even a brewer among them. One of its leaders, the parliamentarian William Wilberforce, fought for decades to end slave trade in the British territories. The Clapham group also pioneered one of the world's first anti-pornography groups, and one of its members helped to found the RSPCA. It also worked tirelessly to reform the prisons. One writer has said that by the end of the 18th century, the ethos of Clapham became the spirit of the age. Ladies and gentlemen, that's what I call influence. These Christians and others like them taught us that revival empowers reform. In 2 Chronicles 7.14 we read, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin and heal their land. Influence is the church's mandate. We find Romans 12.2 tells us that we're meant to have a greater impact on our culture than it does on us. Because we are transformed through the renewing of our minds, we can live out the good, acceptable, perfect will of God, it says. That's referring to the God kind of culture. To do that, we need a new understanding of what many call revival. The promise in 2 Chronicles 7.14 is a response to a prayer offered by King Solomon at the opening of the temple in Jerusalem. He was asking in advance for what many Christians now call revival. He was saying, Lord, if the people of Israel ever lose their passion for you, if they should find that their ardor goes cold, I ask you not to respond to them in kind, but to forgive, to be merciful and to draw us back to yourself. Two things particularly stand out in this verse for me. The first is that when God acts in response to prayer, the first people affected are those who do the praying. God starts his work by forgiving our sins. The word revival doesn't appear in the Bible, and Christians mean so many different things when they talk about revival. It's probably helpful and instructive that I define what I mean by it in the context of this talk. To revive something is to bring it back to life. Our word revive comes from a Latin word that means to live again. I think it's self-evident that you can't bring something back to life if it wasn't alive in the first place. According to the Bible, the world outside of Christ is spiritually dead. In Ephesians 2.1 we read, In the past you were spiritually dead because of your disobedience and sins. We don't come alive spiritually speaking until we surrender our lives to Christ. You may be alive physically, socially, emotionally, even intellectually, 
But until you surrender your life to Christ, you're carrying something dead inside. Strictly speaking, when we talk about revival, we're talking about something that happens to the church, not the wider society. In fact, some church historians prefer the word awakening to revival, and I think that's a great approach. On my 21st birthday, my next door neighbor gave me an alarm clock. It wasn't one of the bells and whistles kind we have today on our phones. It had some cool features though. Probably its worst feature was the snooze button. The alarm would go off every morning. It would wake me up to get out of bed, go and engage the world and hopefully add value to people's lives and bring some honor to God with the gifts he'd given me. But the snooze button allowed me a way out, an escape hatch. And throughout history, there have been many instances of churches that have experienced a powerful reviving or awakening. And yet a few years later, the same churches were crying out for another awakening. They were filled with alertness and passion for a while, but then they decided to hit the snooze button. You see, there's very little point being given an alarm clock if you're not going to get up when it rings. And there's very little point praying for an awakening if you're going to drift back to sleep when all the excitement dies down. The second thing I see in this verse is that when God acts in response to prayer, he wants to take things beyond the church. He wants to bring healing to the entire land. Revival is not intended to be an end in itself. It's a means to an end, and the end is reform. Revival empowers reform. Revival is an awakening of the church to what it's already been empowered and called to do, to change the world. Revival changes the church, but reform changes the world beyond the church. Focusing on revival without reform infers that God is only interested in the growth of the church. He's not that concerned about the fate of his world. Yet we read in Psalm 24, 1, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the whole world and all who live in it. In John 3, 16, the Bible says, God so loved the world that he gave his son. Jesus' saving work wasn't meant just to impact the health of the church, but to impact the entire destiny of the world. In Ephesians 1.22, we're told that God has made Christ the head of all things. From heaven's perspective, Christ isn't just the head of religion or even the church. He's the head of business, of media, of government, of education, of science, and much more. Ephesians also says that he's been given as head over all things to the church. What does that mean? It means that you and I have the responsibility and the joy of expressing the supremacy of Jesus in whatever sphere God has placed us in. Focusing on revival without reform means hitting the snooze button, going back to sleep until the next alarm. God wants us to get out of bed and engage with the needs of the world. When Jesus taught us to pray in Matthew 6, the first thing he commanded us to ask for was the coming of the kingdom of God. And the relationship between the church and the kingdom is a very important one in the New Testament. The church is to the kingdom what family is to society. Family is the fundamental building block of society. The church is the fundamental building block of the kingdom of God. You can't say you're working for the best interests of society if you're working against the family. You can't say you're working for the best interest of the kingdom if you're not actively engaged in the life of a vibrant church. The kingdom and the church are closely related, but they're not exactly the same thing. You can't take the local church to work with you on Monday, but you carry the kingdom wherever you go. The kingdom of God is wherever the loving rule of Christ is transforming human hearts, relationships, cultures, and the institutions to which human beings belong. Reform is concerned with bringing kingdom influence to the institutions, the structures, the cultures of God's world. It's about promoting the righteousness of God's kingdom in the world. In history, there have been many revivals within churches that now lie forgotten, buried under the sands of time. The awakenings we remember are those that have led to the reform of society and its cultures. The Lord's Prayer was, of course, written for us by the first apostles of Christ. The English word apostle comes from the Greek apostolos, which means someone who is sent, an envoy, a messenger. But when it first emerged, around 380 BC, the word referred specifically to a naval commander, a naval officer, an admiral. Often it also covered his fleet of ships. 
In the fleet were artisans, engineers, all sorts of people who could help through their expertise to bring the home culture to a foreign world. Churches and networks that have a truly New Testament apostolic pattern won't just see bigger crowds on Sunday, they'll engage all of society's spheres of influence to reproduce kingdom culture. They'll behave like fleets of ships loaded with technologists, managers, tradespeople, engineers, entertainers and so much more, all of whom share just one goal, to extend the culture of the kingdom. A church in constant search of revival year in and year out is like a ship or a fleet constantly sailing around the home harbour, afraid to venture further afield, reluctant to carry out its designated task, which is taking the home culture to the world. By appropriating the word apostle to the cause of the gospel, Jesus and the New Testament writers were telling us something very significant about the work you and I are called to do. We're not just spiritual revivalists, we're also social reformers. One man who understood this very well was Pastor Clem Pinckney. He was well known in his South Carolina community for the good work he did. But his life was cut tragically short one night in June 2015, when a lone gunman invaded a prayer meeting and shot and killed nine people. The pastor's funeral was attended by people from far and wide. His eulogy was presented by none less than President Barack Obama. It was obvious to anyone that this man had left a powerful mark on his city. Speaking at the funeral, the church's associate minister related how people often asked their pastor why he not only led this thriving, growing church, but also worked hard as a member of the State Senate of South Carolina. He said pastor did this because he knew that decisions about better roads were not made in church. Decisions today about better media, better uses of technology, better health care and education are not made in church on a Sunday. Christians engaged in the mainstream marketplace of ideas, products, services are uniquely placed to bring reform to entire cultures and institutions. We see reform like revival begins with you and me. One of the areas that is most in need of reform in our society is technology. I think we're starting to realise today that not all of the effects of modern technology are positive. One of the first intellectuals to understand this was a Christian. A French sociologist by the name of Jacques Ellul, a professor at the University of Bordeaux. Writing in the middle of last century, he spoke about what he called technique. Now technique is not technology as we know it, it's something bigger. Ellul wasn't writing about the machines of his age or the gadgets we use today. He was talking about the mentality that tech often brings with it. He observed that from the Industrial Revolution onwards, we started to look at every area of human activity and search for the most efficient way of performing tasks. We searched for efficiencies in time, resources, energy expended and so on. Then we developed machines to help us repeat tasks in the most efficient way. Over time, efficiency became a primary goal, not only in technology but in how we live our lives. By pursuing efficiency, which usually means reducing tasks to their lowest common denominator, a little believed we started to neglect some of the core needs of our humanity. Consider the way you navigate a car journey. In years gone by, you could take a map, identify start and end points, and look for the most direct route. But then you might discover points of interest or diversion on either side of that straight line. Today, sat-navs won't recommend the most interesting routes, they're only programmed for efficiency. That's their default setting. Human experience and relationships do suffer when we make efficiency our top priority. Today I think we see what Professor Alul was really warning us about. Technology definitely makes us more efficient, but not necessarily more human or humane. I need to say here that Christians are definitely not anti-technology. We see technological innovation as an expression of the God-likeness within human nature and the fulfilment of the first command given to us in Genesis 1.28 that we should subdue the earth and have dominion, loving stewardship over it. We see technology as the use of raw materials of the natural environment and the ingenuity of the human mind to exercise that loving stewardship for God's glory. You might be interested to know that John Wesley, whom we spoke of earlier, 
wrote one of the first books on natural medicine and another on electricity. He also designed and built an early electric machine. Christians are not anti-tech. During the COVID-19 lockdown, we've become even more reliant on technology than we were before. But this is also a good time for us to reflect on how we use technology. Technology needs reform in its social media platforms. Social media is wonderful. On the plus side, it gives us mass communication, which provides the ground for mass collaboration. We can work together if we want with people from all across the world to solve intractable problems. But on the minor side, we have a thing called social disinhibition, which is a psychologist's way of saying people will do online what they'd never dream of doing offline. A couple of years ago, 2% of 2,000 people in Britain said they had actually insulted someone they didn't know online in the past year. Now, 2% of 2,000 doesn't sound like very much, but if you extrapolate that across the whole population, that's 2 million people insulting people they don't know. This lockdown gives us a great opportunity to ask some questions about how we might make better use of technology. How can I use these tools to honour God? How can I use them to exercise better stewardship over my resources, my time and money, for example? How can I use them to build and maintain healthy relationships? Did you know that a growing number of people who use dating apps before they were married keep their membership after their marriage? They say they do it to find new friends. I wonder, though, whether some of them are just trying to keep their options open. Listen, if you're married, your options are closed. Enjoy what you have. We need to ask, what adjustments do I need to make so that efficiency doesn't swallow up my humanity? Why not try deliberately doing some things inefficiently this week? I'm not talking about an excuse for sloppiness. I'm talking about taking the risk of doing things without technology. Do some arithmetic by hand, write on notebooks that don't require batteries. Why not deliberately add one non-tech experience to your timeline this week? Take a more picturesque route in your walk to the shops. Listen to the trees, because the original Twitter is in the trees. Why not show someone a kindness in person this week? You can do that even in the age of social distancing. Why not do one thing that makes you smile, but doesn't involve technology? The bottom line is, friends, we need to use the lockdown to find innovative, fresh ways to use technology. In the process, we're making our own small but deliberate efforts to reform something, to bring healing to the land. So as we pray for revival, let's also look for ways to bring reform, remembering that revival empowers reform. While we pray for awakenings in the church, let's work to produce reform in the wider society, in focused and very specific areas of need. Wow, what a powerful message today. If you'd like more information on Mal Fletcher's London-based think tank on social change and leadership innovation, go to 2030plus.com. You know, social reformation so often starts with personal transformation. Change lives equal a changed society. Jesus came into this world not just to give us a good philosophy class, but to reignite our long-lost relationship with God. He died for you because he loves you. He hates sin because of what it does to us and how it enslaves us. Jesus came because he has a purpose beyond the new normal for your life, beyond our self-imposed restrictions and boundaries. You know, I feel that there are people here today watching today that God has called to this point in time so Mal could speak directly into your life. Right now, God is gathering a people, the next generation of reformers and world changers. But the one thing you need is power. That power comes by having a relationship with your Father in heaven in real time. If you want this relationship to be reborn or rekindled because you've lost it along the way, this is your moment to recommit your life to God. Should we say a prayer together in our homes? Thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for my sins. Please forgive me for my wrongdoing. Today, I wanna to live for your purposes in my life. Please awaken the Holy Spirit in me today. In Jesus' name, amen. If you said that prayer for the first time, there's a clicker button there just below. 
you know the new normal of church is going to be life in smaller groups. If you'd like to be part of a small group, go to connect at newlifechurch.me. We would love to be part of your newfound Christian journey. Um, at the moment, they run through Zoom, but eventually, probably soon, they'll be back in homes across the South Coast. There's also a virtual lounge on Zoom right now after the service. We would love just to chat with you if you'd like to meet one of our online pastors and chat about life, what's going on in your own world. We would love to meet you right now. We'll see you next week, church. We love you. Be strong, be courageous. Have a great week. Mm -hmm.